And uh, I would like to introduce the, the last speaker, uh, Dr. Ken Takahashi. Uh, Dr. Takahashi is a pediatric cardiologist. He is an editorial committee member of the Japanese Society of Pediatric Cardiology and a board member of the Japanese Society of Echocardiography. He is currently appointed to the professor and the director of the Department of Pediatric Pediatrics at Juntendo University Urayasu Hospital. His research interests include congenital heart disease and left ventricular diastolic function. He has studied pediatric echocardiography at Hospital for Sick Children in Toronto and University of Alberta. The title of his lecture is New Insights into the Interventricular Pressure Gradient and its Significance for Future Adulthood Surgical Interventions. We'll start his pre-recorded lecture. Please go ahead. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, esteemed colleagues, it's my distinct honor to address you today at this prestigious international conference. I'm Ken Takahashi from Department of Pediatrics, Juntendo University, Urais Hospital. Today, I will be presenting on the topics titled New Insight into the Interventricular Pressure Gradient and its Significance for Future Adulthood Surgical Intervention. I look forward to sharing our findings and engaging in good discussion that may provide a way for innovative treatment and strategies in pediatric cardiology. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak today, and I'm eager to exchange ideas learned from all of you. No relationship to disclose. I will not discuss off-level use and or investigational use of any drugs or devices. And this slide shows the background of this presentation. IBPD and IBPG is an essential indicator of active diastolic function, representing the left ventricle's ability to actively suck blood from the left atrium. Despite its interest as a cardiac function marker and being studied for over 20 years, it has not become widespread for several reasons. I will present on the measurement of IBPD in the children and adults with congenital heart disease, including the background and future prospect. This is today's content. First, introduction, and next, how to measure IBPD or IBPG, and next, clinical implications of IBPD or IBPG. Then clinical outcome and cardiac dysfunction in tetralogy of furrow. And next, IBPG in a patient with tetralogy of furrow. And then a future prospect. And this slide shows definition of IBPD and IBPG. So interventricular pressure difference is IBPD, and interventricular pressure gradient is IBPG, and IBPG equals IBPD divided by left ventricular length. And this IBPG is effective when comparing hearts of different sizes. IBPD and IBPGs are often confused and used interchangeably. Since the left ventricular length can vary by threefold between children and adults, IBPG is particularly useful when including pediatric cases and adult cases. So conventional cardiac function analysis typically involves analyzing the movement of the left ventricle wall. This mainly includes recent measures like longitudinal and circumferential strain, and classically the left ventricular ejection fraction. New cardiac function analysis involves blood flow analysis. In industrial applications, analyzing the movement of fluid is essential for evaluating pump function. I believe that fluid dynamic assessment should also be evaluated in the left ventricle. 
This slide demonstrates the blood flow within the left ventricle. And this figure shows left atrium and left ventricle and aorta in apical long axis view. The blue line indicates the direction of the blood flow, which sometimes forms straight line and other times create a vortex, as can be observed here. To measure IVPD during early diastole, it is necessary to position the echocardiographic castle from the apex to the mitral valve during early diastole. This figure demonstrates how intraventricular pressure difference develops within the left ventricle. This line represents left atrial pressure, and this line shows um, left ventricular pressure. And this is an um, isobaric relaxation time, and this, uh, this phase is early diastole. And uh, this is an enlarged view of the pressure curve. At this timing, the pressure at the left um, ventricular apex is lower than the mitral valve of the left ventricle. This creates a negative pressure known as IVPD, which actively uh, sucks blood from the left atrium to the left ventricle. This is a historically significant paper on IVPD research. In this paper, Euler's equation was used to calculate IVPD using column M mode. This figure illustrates the intraventricular pressure difference occurring as a negative pressure from the left atrium to the left ventricle during early diastole. This page demonstrates the actual measurement method used in our faculty. Measurements are taken from the apical four chamber view or apical long axis view. In congenital heart disease, the position of the aorta often differs from the normal left ventricle, so measurements are frequently made from the four chamber view. As in previous studies, the castle is placed from the apex to the central 60% of the mitral valve. To simplify calculation and ensure that blood flow velocity doesn't exceed the nice limit, the color baseline is shifted, and the display is changed red to red only. Again, this is the same figure we saw on the previous page. I will explain what basal IBPD and apical IBPD represent. So this red line shows this red line shows the interventricular pressure gradient difference at the timing of the peak IBPD. So basal IBPD and here basal IBPD uh, reflects the pressure of the left atrium on the basal third, as well as the uh, stiffness of the left ventricle. This Apical IBPD reflects the two thirds of the active diastolic capacity on the apical side, representing active diastolic function. The exercise capacity is one of the best pronounced indicators maintained by the increase of cardiac output during exercise in heart failure, regardless of LVEF. IVPD during exercise were closely associated with exercise capacity in a patient with heart rate heart, heart failure. In addition, submaximal IVPD could be a useful predictor of exercise capacity without peak exercise in heart failure patient. It means IVPD will be very useful in a clinical scene. The aim of the present study was to determine the difference in the spatial distribution of IBPD between patients with heart failure and normal controls. In patients with heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, HFF, and those with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, HFF, apical IBPDs were reduced while basilar IBPDs were maintained by elevated left atrial pressure resulting in preserved yield. 
IBPD will potentially be useful for distinguish between HFPEF and HFREF. In this paper, the authors classified patients with various levels of heart failure and healthy individuals using unsupervised machine learning. So during this process, fluid dynamics indicates such as voltage C and IVPD played a more significant role than traditional me uh, metrics like left ventricular ejection fraction and diastolic function parameters and strain. IVPD may, be, may play a crucial role in creating a new classification of disease in the future. This is the paper from our faculty. In a pediatric cancer survivors, a decline in cardiac function during long-term follow-up a crucial issue that can impact life prognosis. Although it is a cross-sectional study, we compared whether strain or IBPG is a more sensitive indicator across different age groups. The results showed that IBPG differ more significantly than the strain, suggesting it might be a more sensitive indicator of cardiac function. So we decided to investigate the measurement of IVPD or IVPZ in congenital heart disease, specifically in tetralogy of Faro, because it is the more common, most common scientific congenital heart disease. So as a clinical future, the prognosis varies greatly depending on the age at surgery, timing of the surgery, and the surgical method. Alongside primary valve dysfunction and right ventricular failure, left ventricular dysfunction is also an important prognosis indicator. Therefore, we have considered whether IVPD or IVPG can be used as a more sensitive indicator at our faculty. This slide shows anatomical future of tetralogy furrow. The so anatomical definition of tetralogy furrow is ventricular septal defect, overriding of the aorta on the intraventricular septum, and primary stenosis, and sometimes subvalvular and valvular and supravalvular, and right ventricular hypertrophy. This slide illustrates the mechanism of cardiac dysfunction in a patient with tetralogy of furrow. For example, long uh, waiting time before surgery, the use of cardiopulmonary bypass, and VSD patch closure at right ventricular incision, and pulmonary valve stenosis with regurgitation are present. So those factors lead to myocardial hypoxia and abnormal movement of IVS and right band, right band branch block and right ventricular volume and pressure overload. Consequently, they cause myocardial damage and desynchronous movement and myocardial fibrosis and ultimately cardiac dysfunction. This slide shows clinical outcome of tetralogy follow. This paper follows almost 1,000 patients who underwent intracardiac repair of tetralogy follow over a long period. Life uh, pregnant, uh, prognosis is generally favorable in patients survive immediately post-surgery. However, there is an increasing trend in the clinical complications such as heart failure and other issues. In this slide, the left figure shows the difference in the prognosis based on the surgical method. So transatrial surgery has the best prognosis, while transannual repair 
which involves extensive incision in the right ventricle, have the worst prognosis. The right figure illustrates the difference in life prognosis based on the timing of the surgery. The prognosis for case operated on before 1990 is the worst. This is a large scale study of more than 400 patients with tetralogy follow. This is the first paper to use echocardiography on large scale patient group and the first large scale publication to discuss prognosis from echocardiographic indicators. And in this paper, the left ventricular function such as global long channel strain or MAPSHE was one of the important factors for clinical outcomes. This is a paper from our group. Although it involves a small sample size of 59 individuals, we divided them into three age groups. We measured a circumferential strain and long term strain at three levels, three different levels, from inner and mid to outer. The results showed that in children under 10 years old, the endocardial strain at the basal and papillary muscle level decreased. With increasing age, the number of sites showing a decrease in strain increased. And by the age of 21 and older, nearly all circumferential strain and endocardial longitudinal strain had reduced. This paper is also from our groups. The purpose of this study was to determine whether IVPG is more useful compared to other cardiac function indicators in patients with tetralogy follow. We compared 39 patients aged between 4 to 40 years with normal subject. We measured IVPG and long-term and circumferential strain at papillary muscle levels. And this slide shows typical data from normal subject and tetralogy follow. The top row represents normal subject and the bottom row represents tetralogy follow. As previously demonstrated in the earlier slide, we used uh, the color M mode to calculate IBPG. And visually, it is um, evident that the mitral valve inflow um, extend to the apex in the normal subject, but in a patient with tetralogy furrow, uh, it reaches only mid at the left ventricle. And the right figure demonstrates the IBPG at the timing of peak IBPG. So surprisingly, peak IBPG is almost the same between normal subject and tetralogy furrow. However, and while the mid to apical IBPG is greater in a normal subject compared to basal IBPG, so the basal IBPG in tetralogy follow is uh, greater than mid to apical IBPG. And this slide it illustrates the age distribution of IBPG. The vertical uh, axis represents IBPG and the horizontal axis uh, represents the age from 4 years old to 40 years old. And the red point indicates data of tetralogy furrow, while blue points represent data of normal subject. The, top, um, the left shows total IBPG. As previously described, I, I explained, there is no significant difference in total IBPG between normal subject and uh, tetralogy furrow. And looking at the basal IBPG, so it is clear that IBPG is elevated from childhood in the tetralogy furrow. And this mid to apical IBPG shows a no significant difference during childhood, but 
it notably decreases in adulthood in patients with cetology furrow. We performed statistical calculation by dividing the subject into three age groups, so 4 to 10 and 11 to 20 and 21 to 40 years old. Data marked with this symbol uh, indicate a significant difference from the normal group of the same age. As expected, uh, there is no significant difference in the no and in total IBPG. So, however, base IBPG is consistently higher in tetralogy furrow across all age group. And mid to apical IBPG suggests decline with increasing age. So this is additional measurement data. So circumferential strain and longitudinal strain also decrease from second age group in a patient with tetralogy furrow. And the relationship with IVPG and other parameters are very interesting. So this meets the apical IVPG mainly correlate with torsion and untwisting rate and strains. But I best IVPG was mainly related to E and E bar E prime. And both meets the apical IVPGs and best IVPGs related with QRS duration. So this slide demonstrates mechanisms underlying the reduction of mid to apical IPPG. The upper part is the same as shown in the previous slide, and it is believed that IPPG is created by a very coordinated motion of left ventricle wall during very short period. And it can decrease not only due to myocardial dysfunction, but also by uh, due to the dyschronal, dyssynchronous movement of left ventricle. And this cause decreases mid to apical IBPG. This slide illustrates the mechanism behind the reduction of basal IBPG. So myocardial dysfunction and uh, fibrosis are thought to worsen the LV stiffness. And consequently, the, this could lead to increase in left atrial pressure, and which is believed to include basal IVPG. This slide shows frequently asked questions about IVPD. Question 1. Why use color M mode? Because very high temporal resolution is required. The question two, is the accuracy okay? Yes, it has already been proven by comparing it with actual catheter-based data in numerous studies. And the question three, what are the precautions during data collection? It is important to place the castle within 60% of the center of the mitral valve from the IVEX, and only usable during early diastolic laminar flow. Again, this slide shows frequently asked questions about IBPD and IBPG. Why IBPD measurement has not become widespread? First, commercially available systems are not widespread. And second, after exporting images, there is a need to analyze them using house-made software on research computer. And accurate measurement requires advanced skills. And extensive training is necessary to keep inter-observers and intra-observer errors within 10%. And capturing a straight blood flow from the mitral valve to the apex during early diastole along a line connecting the apex and the inner 60% of the mitral valve is surprisingly difficult in some cases. This slide shows future prospect. If two-dimensional color data can capture the direction of the blood flow, and if it is captured at an ultra-high frame rate, such as 400 or 600 frame rate per second, then it would be possible to place a castle freely afterward 
and collected IBPG on the cursor. This could potentially show for broader adaptation. And according to this paper, currently such measurements are only possible with probe designed for children. This slide also showed future prospect. We have already developed a system to calculate IBPD using data from transesophageal echocardiography. So there is a potential to gain a new insight into the case where measuring IBPD from transthoracic echocardiography is challenging. As well as during the left ventricular function measurement in the catheter intervention or in during surgery. Thank you for your attention today. I'm Ken Takahashi from Jundeido University, Urias Hospital. It has been an honor to share insight into the intraventricular pressure gradient and discuss its future implications. I appreciate your engagement and look forward to further conversation. Thank you very much. CT scan and can be easily validated with body flow MRI uh, because of the uh, 3D coordinate system uh, can be co uh, incited. Uh, however, uh, validation uh, between the uh, echocardiography and MRI is a little bit difficult. Uh, as you know, uh, echocardiography uh, is based on uh, uh, measurement plane and that uh, cannot be fixed. Uh, in 3D space. Uh, so, uh, for example, uh, uh, quantitative uh, validation uh, such as uh, vortex shape or uh, uh, location of the vortex center uh, can be validated. And it uh, actually has a, a quite similar uh, uh, blood flow is realized both in MRI and echocardiography. But quantitative uh, validation, uh, pixel by pixel, is difficult uh, because of the coordinate uh, problem. Thank you. We have another question from the audience. Uh, we focus on your session on uh, grown-up congenital heart disease patients. Uh, have you used your technology in patients with bicuspid aortic valve and see if abnormal flow can be a good predictor of aortic rupture or aortic dissection? Uh, yeah, actually, uh, bicuspid aortic valve is a common disease uh, and uh, I have several experiences and uh, I know several uh, papers uh, uh, based on 40 flow MRI and some kind of swelling flow uh, inside the ascending aorta uh, causes abnormal uh, wall shear stress distribution, uh, which also causes uh, wall shear stress oscillation, uh, uh, a parameter such as uh, OSI, oscillatory shear index, uh, would be uh, abnormal uh, in this case. And that would be a predictor of uh, aortic enlargement or uh, aortic dissection, uh, I suppose. Thank you. And the uh, next question is, and I, I think it probably refers to practice, daily practice of all of us um, in operating room. How close is your technology to daily use in OR? You mentioned you need special software, you need to do uh, post analysis uh, is it is it any close to make a intra op or peri op decision making or we still need more improvement and more validation what is opinion of all of you who are involved with this uh, measurements research and technology yeah actually if we deploy mli is a medical device uh, because i have acquired the fda approval and regarding my uh, surgical case, all of the case underwent for deploy MRI preoperatively. Uh, and the uh, effect of hemodynamic improvement uh, is also examined by postoperative for deploy MRI. Uh, that is a quite uh, a routine work uh, uh, tool for, uh, for us. 
But can you Mac can you use part of this technology in TE? You showed some nice pictures and, and your colleagues as well doing some of the measurements using TE. How and this is probably the most practical application. Yeah, uh, maybe uh, Dr. Akiyama uh, uh, will answer the question. Oh, he is a main user of vector flow mapping in TEE. Yes, um, if we bring the analysis computer, we can uh, do the fluid dynamics analysis um, real time. Yeah, uh, because the software is uh, so easy handled and uh, only a, a laptop PC, a one laptop PC is necessary to analyze the flow uh, intraoperatively. So does it happen that if you see still abnormal flow, your surgeon will redo certain uh, anastomosis or reinforce certain repairs? And, and how often does it happen? Yeah, uh, uh, I would like to reduce the uh, abnormality or uh, redo uh, in my uh, surgical practice for this purpose. I simulate every time before the surgery, uh, but actually uh, it uh, sometimes happens. Uh, so uh, I have check. Uh, I always check the uh, blood flow uh, during the uh, before the pump off. And if there's uh, abnormal findings, uh, I perform uh, re reconstruction in my case. Perfect. Takahashi sensei, you show very nicely the traje trajectory of uh, patients from childhood to adulthood and how abnormal uh, intraventricular uh, uh, gradient is and how it affects their, their prognosis potentially. Do you potentially, yep. Potentially. So I understand this is uh, this is still area of future research. Apply your findings, do long term follow up, and potentially modify therapy. Is it correct? Yep. Yeah. Oh, well, thank you very much for your comment. And the, in the patient with tetralogy furrow, so strain, uh, strain of uh, especially longitudinal strain, it's one of the uh, outcome predictor. But uh, by my experience, uh, in some uh, in some disease, the IVPG decreases uh, more rapidly compared to strain. So then I think uh, this um, IVPG parameters can be used for good, uh, well, more sensitive parameter to uh, expect a clinical outcome in the future. Great, that's that's very interesting. Um, um, I have a I have a question to Dr. Fukano and to Dr. Hirasaki. Your yes. first lecture put a, a great uh, uh, outline for the rest of lectures presented in your session. I'm curious because it's still a big problem in most of countries. We know that the population of grown up congenitals is growing very rapidly. There is more of them than than pediatric patients in many countries. Uh, but but we still struggle to have enough uh, co grown up or adult congenital centers looking after these patients. How does it look in Japan? Because probably most of our audience doesn't know. Well, uh, in Japan, uh, there are so many hospitals scattering all over the country, and it's not centralized. We don't have a uh, very limited number of uh, institutes or hospital that uh, focuses on other congenital heart disease. So uh, each hospital deals with or take care of the patients, very, very small number of patients, uh, which is a problem. And uh, probably one, only one exception, exception or a rare exception, exception is the uh, Dr. Itatani's Institute. Uh, which hopefully will take what happens uh, in the other side of country. And so uh, in terms of uh, education or research, there are so, uh, the, the resource, resource is so limited that we don't have any uh, objective data in this, on, in this population. Uh, we look forward to move on to um, making a, a centralized system. 
Definitely, yeah. the cases which you all of you showed are very complicated and complex, which which just reflects of what you mentioned. Uh, I'm curious, what is uh, what is your perspective, Itatani Sensei, as as a cardiac surgeon, and Takahashi Sensei as a pediatric cardiologist? Where where is the next step? Uh, we have own struggles as well in Canada, so I'm I'm curious, and probably we can learn from each other. Uh, thank you. Uh, actually, we too uh, are uh, collaborators regarding the diastolic function of congenital heart disease. Uh, so, uh, I am a surgeon and uh, I'm interested in the post operative cause of my surgical cases. Uh, uh, in, this, uh, in my opinion, uh, diastolic function of the main uh, uh, ventricle. So oh, it's, it's so important uh, to support the uh, whole circulatory system. And that is why I collaborated with Dr. Takahashi uh, to examine uh, the uh, diastolic function uh, via uh, IBPG. Hi. Um, actually, Dr. Itatani explained everything about this one. I'm, so I'm a specialist for diastolic function. So I. Yeah, I want to develop this technique and I use uh, so for not only for tetralogy follow so for any other disease and then uh, I can get very nice I want to get a nice um, result and then I want to spread it yes perfect um, I think among our um, guests we have uh, Dr. Rafa Alonso who is uh, uh, who is the chief of uh, adult uh, congenital cardiology in our hospital. I'm sure, Rafa, you have some questions. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Marcin, for inviting me to be part of the panel and uh, congratulations to the presenters for excellent, uh, excellent presentations. I, I have a, um, a couple of questions. One is, uh, is about the use of the, of the interventricular pressure gradient in clinical practice. So I think that is something that uh, that we we are not doing in the adult side here. We are doing in the pediatric side, but as the the I think uh, as you mentioned, T is a, a great tool to to measure the grading in these patients. But how do you apply that in clinical practice? We know that it has a better assessment of the ventricle and and, and many other functions. But in your day to day, what is your use of the, the of the of the interventricular pressure gradient in your clinical practice? Yes. Uh, yes. Yeah. Uh, now, I'm mainly I'm you. I using this technique for the patient after uh, uh, survivors of cardiac cancer because uh, after uh, anticyclically used, the patient tends to show uh, cardiac dysfunction, and it's uh, very important for clinical outcome. Then, uh, already I published some papers about for this kind of patient, and then compared to strain analysis, this. IBPG tends to decrease rapidly compared to longitudinal and surface strain in a patient uh, of cardiac cancer. Then, so this is, I think this is more sensitive indicator. Then sometimes uh, I should use DORAC before strain decrease, and then when we find IBPG decreasing. And probably uh, we can use uh, this technique for not only for the patient with after cardiac cancer and uh, um, uh, pediatric cancer survivors, also for uh, this kind of uh, adult food uh, congenital heart disease. But uh, we now we are collecting more data for this kind of patient. Mm -hmm. So I have, I have one question for Dr. Tatani regarding the 4D <clears throat> MRI. So I think that the, the the data you showed is excellent. And I think that if anything, 4D MRI has given us is the is the possibility of looking at flow. And uh, you showed a couple of cases with Fontan that are were excellent examples where 4D MRI made a difference in the management of the patient. My question is, do you use it as part of your regular clinical practices? Do you do 4D MRI? in every single patient or just when you have a clinical question that you need to answer just for the time consuming of the technique yeah uh as uh, i answered earlier 
uh, all of my surgical case uh, under uh, go uh, body flow MRI except for uh, pacemaker case. Uh, so uh, it's a kind of a routine work. Uh, for example, uh, in a pulmonary bubble replacement uh, after the uh, the large bubble repair, uh, so many cases has abnormal uh, RVOD uh, muscles. Uh, that can be uh, correctly uh, detected by 4D flow MRI uh, with flow acceleration. Uh, uh, and uh, as uh, I uh, perform uh, uh, peripheral pulmonary arterial plasty, uh, plasty even in TBR, uh, for future uh, uh, optimal hemodynamics uh, for all my cases. Uh, so examination of the hemodynamics uh, is uh, quite important in adult congenital heart surgical uh, practice. That is why a uh, deploy MRI is a kind of routine examination. Yeah, that, that, that's great. We we do not have the full disclosure. We do not have for deploy MRI in the hospital. So it's one of my dreams. So okay, I think that Marcia don't have more questions. So I think uh, our time is up uh, once again. Uh, my big thanks to Yuji. You prepare excellent session and thank you, thank you so much for all your lectures to all four presenters. I'm really sorry for our technical error at the beginning. No. As you mentioned, we are not Yakuza, so I'm not gonna to cut my finger, but I feel personally responsible for this problem. I'm so sorry. Uh, please uh, join us if you still have energy. I know it's 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 a late night in Japan. And thank you, um, thank you very much. Arigato gozaimasu. Thank you. Thank you very much. Arigato gozaimasu.